Good evening, everybody. My name is Ken Rosenthal. I'm a park naturalist at Gulf Ranch Nature Center in Arlington County, uh, and I'd like to welcome you to this evening's deep dive. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we are going to get started. Turn off that noisemaker in case you all can hear that. Um, oops, screen. There we go. All right, hopefully everybody is seeing this. We're going to go ahead and get started. We're going to go ahead and there we go. No, we are not going to get started there. That's a teaser for later on in the program. OK, um, so good evening, everybody. Um, I. I'm a big fan of herps and I'm a big fan of insects and I'm a big fan of birds and there's less of pretty much all of those in the winter. Um, so I've always had to, to work a little to find uh, to get more excited about winter. Uh, than I always was. Don't get me wrong, I love playing in the snow. I love those kinds of things, which other people apparently don't as much. Um, but nature in winter has always been a little bit of a struggle for me. And so I really enjoy talking about uh, wintertime economics because I think that <clears throat> talking about um, what you have and what you don't have and what you can lose in kind of a uh, economic framework really makes sense, especially in winter, because you're really trying to conserve heat. You're really trying to maximize your ability to bring in calories and use as few as possible. Uh, and so there's a lot of that going on for, for organisms, uh, and that's really how you make it through. Winter is really a, a, a tough time. Uh, for a lot of critters that that stay active, um, that don't avoid the winter. Uh, and so that's what I, I want to go through a little bit. So again, as I mentioned, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to catch my attention uh, during the presentation so that we don't wait till the end and we, we lose the moment. Um, so the first step uh, is identifying the problem. I, I think this is a really easy answer. It's cold. It's cold out. Now, um, that doesn't always seem like a problem. We've got coats and galoshes. Galoshes is a nice word. Uh, hats and mittens, all those kinds of things. Um, but the cold is a problem because tissues can freeze. That's really bad news. Uh, it can depress metabolism in, in uh, organisms that are not able to uh, regulate their body temperature inside. Uh, and for some organisms, um, there's a dearth of food. The food that they eat is no longer here. Uh, because of depressed metabolism and freezing tissues. Um, so it's a compounding problem. So some critters, they've either got to switch what they eat or find something new to eat or go somewhere where they can still find what they want to eat. So all these um, issues here are the underlying problem that comes with it's cold outside. And so what are um, the options for these organisms to avoid this problem? Um, and I want to take a momentary digression in the chemistry real quick. This is what uh, the molecular structure of what water looks like uh, when it freezes. The point here, pun completely intended, is it's pointy. Um, water forms crystals when it freezes. This can push up against or even um, rupture cell membranes. Uh, it can be really bad news for organisms. So freezing tissues is not uh, a very good uh, condition condition to go through. Um, and so that's one of the, the big issues with the cold, especially um, when it comes to, you know, the, the physical uh, body of these organisms. So there's an easy solution. Just don't be around for winter. Uh, you can take a, a really long nap. You can suspend all activities. Uh, you can really minimize the uh, intake of calories that you do need to worry about, but also the use of calories uh, for heating. Uh, animals that go undergo true hibernation have a severely depressed body temperature uh, and their heartbeats uh, drop dramatically. Uh, it's a really significant change in both um, the the temperature of their body and the the metabolism that's going on uh, and in true mit hibernation uh, those hibernators don't tend to rouse easily either this is a state that's achieved uh, their body has physiological and chemical um, adaptations that they go through to to manage the production of waste from the metabolism that is still happening uh, and that's how they make it through and they tend to um, to keep with my theme they tend to accumulate um, uh, an extra amount of assets prior to hibernation. So when they go through them, they will have less than when they started, but they will still be soluble. I can't do them. I can't do the, uh, the economic talk too much. Um, they eat a lot of food before they go in and they get fat and they lose a tremendous amount of that. Um, a, a groundhog or woodchuck like this might lose 20 to 36, 37% of its um, weight 
through the hibernation process. They come out looking a whole lot thinner than they started in the fall. Um, and even organisms that go through torpor are doing the same thing. They might not have the, the sleep for the entire season, but they might they become inactive, go through a, you know the deep torpor for several days. They wake up, they recharge with some food. So they bring in calories, they eliminate waste. I'm thinking of um, something the chipmunks do where they sleep for several days, they wake up, they have a meal, they eliminate their waste um, in another chamber in their um, uh, in their underground den, and then they go back to sleep for several days, and then they repeat, and this is how they while away the, the summer. So chipmunks also accumulate assets, if you will, but they do it um, uh, not internally. They they store food inside their uh, their den, and so that's why they always seem so busy for, you know, most of the time you see them, because they're either getting food to eat now or they're getting food to eat later. So they're constantly preparing for the winter. Um, and again, it's a seasonal shutdown. You could also have dormancy, which is another type of seasonal um, shutdown for uh, reptiles and amphibians that go through brumation. It's different from hibernation because for a mammal or a bird who are endothermic, whose body temperature stays the same uh, relatively often, you know, a change in body temperature can be a fever or it can be hypothermia, but it's it's not typically quote unquote good um, for an organism like a, a frog, a turtle, a snake, uh, a, a toad, salamander, or you know, all these guys, um, lizards, their body temperature fluctuates with the daily uh, fluctuations of temperature. They're uh, ectotherms, and so they're com they're very much influenced by the outside uh, environment around them. They can nudge it along by going in the shade to cool down, by going out in the sun to warm up to become more active. Um, but having that ability, the ability to do that really lessens, obviously, in winter when temperatures are, are much cooler. Um, so they need to be ready to relocate assets in the case of um, the wood frog and the frogs I'm going to show you. Um, some others go underground. Um, in hibernacula, uh, they go to the bottom of ponds, and we'll, and we'll talk about all these uh, strategies here. Uh, but for wood frogs, for peepers, for tree frogs, <clears throat> they don't have claws on their toes. They can't dig down into the ground. Um, they can hide under leaf litter. They can hide under loose bark. They can hide under, you know, um, uh, sticks in in or, uh, areas like that. But they can't dig down into the ground to avoid freezing. So what I mean by be ready to relocate assets, the minute that the tips of the toes on a wood frog, on a spring peeper, on a on a tree frog, begin to freeze. They sense the the formation of, of crystals. Their bodies begin to send signals around, and they start to move sugars into their um, vital organs. And wood frogs, this is very pronounced. Wood frogs can freeze to the point that they appear to be dead. I'm like, hey, it's a frog sickle. You could pick it up. Uh, I wouldn't do this to it, but you could, you know, touch it or knock it against something, and it would feel solid. It would feel essentially like a frozen frog, but when they thaw within six, I think it's within six hours of thawing, they're up and ready to go and find that special wood frog to make sure there's more wood frogs that can freeze next winter. Um, and, and the tree frogs have similar capacity, though not the same capacity, excuse me, that the wood frog does. The wood frog, I believe, um, and this may not be true on the other hemisphere, but I think in our hemisphere is the northernmost frog you'll find. You can actually find it inside the winter circle. It's able to survive because of that adaptation, because its body moves around sugars to protect its vital organs, so the rest of its tissues um, can essentially freeze, uh, and it's able to go through this. These cryoprotectants in its body are, are really important. Uh, so that's how they make it through, and, and they have that here, though obviously I would say um, our Ver Northern Virginia winters are a little less than other places, say Buffalo or Quebec or the winter, the Arctic Circle. Um, but still, that's some pretty important. Uh, and migration, you can follow the crowds, okay? You can follow the trends. Um, again, for a lot of the birds that migrate, they're losing a food source or the place they find food uh, food source. Um, I grew up in northwestern PA. We didn't see a lot of great blue herons in the winter because a lot of our water froze. Uh, around here, I tend to see herons a lot more, those herons a lot more during the winter because uh, the water doesn't freeze as often around here. And so there's still food in there. There's still um, water to hunt in and there's still food to be found. Um, but, you know, a lot of the um, migratory birds that you think of, especially things like warblers that spend a lot of time eating insects, they're gone because their primary food is out of here. And so there's no reason to, to stick around. Uh, and they tend to, um, um, the uh, business forecast for that is is usually the uh, uh, photo period, the time of day. 
um, the, the time between when the sun rises and when the sun sets. As that gets shorter, it triggers a uh, response in a lot of birds where they begin to um, uh, convert their food in a different way. They begin to accumulate fat in their body. They eat, eat more uh, to get ready for uh, that migratory process. And then they have several different really neat adaptations um, uh, to migrate and I want to get into those now, but I do have a video on YouTube that you can watch. They did a couple months ago. Uh, so migration is pretty neat. But again, this is essentially avoidance. This the the conditions are going to change. The food's not going to be there. Instead of switching your food, you you move somewhere else. Um, there are other solutions. Uh, one that's not so easy is county pennies. For not every organism can leave. Um, not every organism needs to leave. Sometimes there's other food to be found here. Um, I don't know that we have it too many over the ground migrations, um, but a lot of them, the, the ones that stay here, the ones that are still active during the winter, they, they are essentially county pennies and those pennies are heat. Uh, heat moves from a high temperature to a low temperature. Um, that is kind of involuntary. You can't grab the heat and pull it back in. Um, it's once it's gone, it's gone. And so the a lot of these strategies for organism to survive during the winter is about keeping the heat that you produce and continuing to feed the your inner fire adding uh, calories so that you can continue to produce that heat and survive <clears throat> so um your first task if you're going to count your pennies is identify the highest cost okay if you're an endotherm which is a bird or a mammal uh and you're keeping the temperature the same uh that's pretty high cost uh you know it takes a lot of energy it takes a lot of caloric intake in order to make that happen um, big brains are also a, a pretty high cost. If you have a large brain and your brain has a, is um, uh, you know higher functioning, if it if it does a lot of things, that is an energy cost that that needs to be addressed uh, addressed as well because you are spending more of your caloric intake on that brain than certain other animals are. Um, and again, identify potential losses. My favorite example to kids is I always talk about heating up two metal balls. One's the size of a bowling ball. One's the size of a golf ball. I asked them which is going to cool off first. And any kid that's tried to eat a cookie off of a, of a hot tray knows that the smaller the cookie, the quicker it's going to cool. And so they get to that point really quick that the small ball is going to cool. This is, if you want to get really fancy about it and talk physics, um, this is the, um, the difference between uh, something that has a ratio that has a, a ratio of high surface area to volume versus low surface area to volume. The high surface area to volume is the golf ball size piece of metal. The low surface area to volume is the uh, the bowling ball. OK, heat can escape that that smaller one quicker because there's so much more surface area to the volume that heat's able to dissipate quicker. It doesn't move as quickly from the bowling ball. It will if you hit them, heat them up, but you're not continuing to feed that heat and obviously eventually they'll cool down. It may take a lot longer for the bowling ball than the golf ball, but eventually uh, they'll both reach roughly the same temperature in whatever environment they are from when where they were getting heated. And so um, and I'm not going to get into all these shapes here. I just thought this was a really neat graphic, but you know, it shows that each of these shapes has a slightly different um, ratio here that you can see about the surface area versus the volume as they as they get bigger. So again, the bigger you are, the easier it is to keep uh, heat in your body. That's great if you're a big whale underwater, especially if that water is cold. That may not be as great if you're, say, an African elephant, where you're in an area that tends to be hotter a lot hotter uh, with a lot less shade. Uh, but then again, if you have these, um, you know, bigger heat may be a bigger a bigger body with a lot more heat may be a bigger problem, but then you need a bigger solution, which is big ears on an elephant. Uh, and those ears are are helpful in thermal regulating the body temperature of the elephant and they have other adaptations as well, but that's one thing that can really help them dissipate heat quickly. Um, are there any coupons or discounts? Ectothermy is kind of a coupon or a discount. You know, it can be really, really important to um, if you're a um, ectotherm or a cold blooded animal, but you're active at certain times in winter, you can heat up quicker when you're small uh, and you may cool down quicker as well, but it'll give you a chance to um, take advantage of short bursts of heat in an area like Virginia where, you know, we can have three weeks of 30 degree weather and we might have a couple days where it's 50 or 60. You'll see bugs that are out and active. Um, whether they're accomplishing a lot, it's a whole nother story, but you'll see them that are out there and active. They can heat up quick and they can also 
um, they can also cool down quick, which is the, the downfall of that. But that also allows them to be active and, and maybe get a little extra food in. Uh, I wrote expiration data about the snake here. And one of the things to think about if you're a cold blooded animal is uh, for a lot of these uh, ectotherms, there is a temperature that is um, kind of a minimum temperature needed in order to uh, digest. And so if you eat after a certain date, you could be really in trouble because you might not get your body temperature back up to the temperature that you need in order to finish digesting. Um, and so you might see snakes um, in September or October, but if they're preparing to uh, brumate for the winter, they may already already have stopped eating uh, in order to ensure that they have a, a clear digestive system. Because you go in with a bunch of food in your belly uh, and then you're not active in the cold and yes it's cold so it might not be as active in your belly but that stuff that's in there can still ferment can still spoil and that could be bad news for a snake so um these these um snakes and turtles will often stop eating beforehand um because they don't want they don't have the um metabolism won't keep going in the same way when you have a, a cold-blooded metabolism as your temperature go down so does your metabolism um and so stocking up on a lot of food doesn't make sense if your metabolism is to slow down and doesn't need all that uh, and so that can be an issue as well uh, i love bergman's rule um essentially it's a long and short i'm not going to get super into it but i always thought it was kind of interesting if you look at um the same species or the same group of species, what you'll often find is as you get towards the equator, that species gets smaller or that group of species gets smaller. When you move towards the poles, that species gets larger. OK, um, it's kind of um, reversed if you're looking at islands, because sometimes obviously species get smaller on islands. But if you look at deer species, if you look at like fox, which is the example here, when you're somewhere hot, this is an Asian desert red fox on the right. Um, that fox is in a hot area. Being small, having short hair is absolutely an advantage to getting rid of heat as quickly as possible. Um, you're not really going to be worrying about a, a really cold winter necessarily. Uh, and then again, a lot of mammals are also able to shed. You know, so they switch out their fur, go from short, um, thin fur in the summer to longer, thicker fur in the winter. Um, but if you're larger, like this red fox here, this northern red fox, you're still going to be able to, you're going to be able to hold in more heat because you're thicker. Um, and then obviously the longer fur helps as well. Excuse me. The same can be true of deer. Um, if you look at the the size of deer in, say, the Everglades or in Mexico, and you look at the size of the same species of white-tailed deer up in Canada, you're you should see that they are tend to be larger. There's always exceptions. It's a neat rule. Uh, it's really interesting to look at and how it works, but generally the further north you are, there's an advantage to being larger. Obviously having a thicker coat is is is, is uh, really important as well, but being larger as you go north where you're going to need to retain that heat versus being smaller as you go towards the equator where you're going to need to be able to lose heat quicker. Uh, is a really advantage. Just look at the difference in hair between the two sets of ears on these two foxes, uh, and that'll tell you something as well about the different um, the different climates that they are in there. You can see that there's still hair in the in this desert red fox's ear, but it looks like it's only half of the amount of hair uh, that's in that northern red fox. And you know, ears and extremities are another area that can be a big problem uh, as far as uh, being afflicted by frostbite. <clears throat> and then conserve on the left. This is a, uh, and hopefully you can tell just by context, just by looking at the pictures, uh, there's a lot of green in the left. There's not a lot of green in the right, a lot of bare branches, uh, but these are two morning doves at two very different times of year. That morning dove in the left is in the summer. That morning dove in the right is in the winter. Um, I think we've all had that experience where you go outside on the morning and you're like, God, it's really, really cold out here. And you'll look around and sometimes you see the birds and they're just like, they're just like puffed up. Look like they're going to pop if you just look at them the wrong way or just touch them a little bit. A little zap of static electricity from the dry air. Um, when birds fluff up their feathers like that, they create uh, an air cushion around them that they can heat and keep warm. So it's they're essentially kind of almost ca carrying their own blanket uh, with all their feathers, which is really, really cool. I, I wish I could do that. Um, but, you know, we got jackets and that works out OK. And some of our jackets also have those bird feathers in them or uh, a uh, synthetic version of them. Um, but that's what the birds are trying to do. They're conserving that heat uh, and they're keeping it to themselves. You can also notice that 
<clears throat> um, the morning dove on the right is uh, crouch low over its feet, and so its feathers are also insulating parts of its legs and feet as well, which is also really important in the winter. Um, here's a bunch of ring billed glove gloves. Here's a bunch of ring billed gulls uh, standing all uh, barefooted in the snow. I don't know what's wrong with them. It makes me cold just thinking about that um, on the shore of Lake Erie. This is um, I, I tell everybody about this. I bring it up randomly to strangers. This is one of my favorite adaptations of all time. I just think it's fascinating. Birds have, especially birds, uh, shore, um, uh, maybe shore birds, but certainly water birds, ducks and, and geese and gulls, the birds that we'll find around here in the winter because they spend their um, summers up in you know in the northern Canada or around the Arctic uh, breeding, uh, they get those really long days to get as much food as they can. Uh, but they come down here for the winter. It seems so cold. And they're just standing on the ice or they're standing in the snow and these bare feet that are completely um, uninsulated with feathers. You know, here's a here's a nice, uh, pretty standard kind of gull foot. You can see the the leg and the feet, and there's no there's nothing to insulate it. But what's happening is the the artery that's coming out of the body with the warm fresh blood as it's heading down in the foot is running right next to the vein that's returning cold deoxygenated blood from the foot as well at every point along this pair of blood vessels the temperature in the of the blood in the artery is greater than the temperature of the blood in the vein at every point right as it's coming out of the body it's 32 degrees and it's been heated up pretty much in the vein all the way up to this point but it's still not quite at 32 so there's still a little more heat to give and as that that artery um blood begins to cool down here it's still meeting blood that's still slightly colder that's just beginning to reheat from the heat that's coming out so at every point along there the blood in the artery is always slightly warmer or warmer might be more than that but the blood in the artery is always warmer than the blood in the vein and it heats it it's a very very efficient uh means of not losing heat in those feet so by the time that blood uh gets through the artery and and goes away from where the two vessels are paired there's not a whole lot of heat left to loss there's always there's a little bit it's not a perfect system but it conserves, I want to think it's 80 or 90 percent of that heat. It's a quite a tremendous amount of it. it might even be in the mid 90s. Uh, and it, it's amazing. And again, it's just because the two blood vessels right next to each other and that works works so well. Um, and so that's how birds like that, uh, like gulls, like geese, like ducks, you can see them sitting there, um, you know, on the ice. They're standing uh, in the snow. They're paddling in frigid cold water. And they're able to do that because of this countercurrent system that conserves uh, the heat in their blood um something that uh you know a lot of people do you you leave during the day in our case it might be during the day uh if you go to work and maybe you turn the heat down um or you you know you uh change some of the temperature settings whatever the case may be um you know some birds turn the lights out at night this is a, a black cap chickadee um when they go to roost in the in the late afternoon early evening around here it feels like 2 30 today it was so so uh so cloudy and dark uh but when they go to the roost in the evening their body fat's at seven percent but by the time they go out to begin foraging in the morning their body fat has dropped to three percent um yet they do survive um and it doesn't get worse it doesn't drop further than that well how did they survive <clears throat> essentially they change the amount of heat they generate overnight so they might have a daytime body temperature 42 degrees but their nighttime body temperature could drop as low as 30 degrees celsius um i started to do a percentage workout on that earlier when i was working on this and i was like wait that's not right because it's not it's not really an accurate amount of unit but it is a tremendous drop a drop like that in a mammal would be hypothermia or the beginning of hibernation or torpor you know that's a tremendous amount of uh, it's a tremendous drop in body temperature, but using creating less uh, body temperature in the body means you're using less calories overnight. Um, so you're dropping that temperature when it's actually colder and it would be harder to maintain a higher body temperature. You know, if it's a nice day like yesterday <laughs> or um, was it Saturday or the weekend? It was nice and sunny. If it's, you know, it's one of those nice, you know, sunny days. No matter how cold it is out, it always feels just a little bit warmer. Just having the sun on you you feel that a little bit of extra heat energy from that 
maintaining a body temperature 42 degrees during the day is easier when you've got that that little bit of extra heat it's warmer than obviously the overnight um and so it doesn't take as much energy to maintain that body temperature especially if you're active uh, and you're generating heat that way as well. But at nighttime when you're roosting, you know, letting your body temperature drop lower so you have to use less energy to maintain a, a lower temperature uh, is certainly a, an astounding way to do this. And again, I, I say this as if it's a plan. Um, this is simply what they do. This isn't, a, you know, a written down plan and, and manifesto that is um, that every uh, chickadee is going to do. This is simply what they do, but it's fascinating and it, and it helps them survive to get through the winter. <clears throat> oh, and these are the, the body temperatures. This was a, a degree of some black capped chickadees, but I want to move on to another set of birds, which are really fantastic as well. And these are the kinglets. These are for us winter birds. We don't you're not going to find these um, very often in the summer. And if you do, um, it's probably a big deal because they, they shouldn't be here. They're typically up north uh, during the summer and we get to see them in the winter. On the left is a ruby crown kinglet. You see that little speck of red on the top. Uh, and on the right is a golden crown kinglet. These are um, really small birds. They're very active. Uh, I remember being out with my mom once birding and we stopped and uh, got a kinglet. And she said, that's the first time she said in probably half a dozen tries I've actually been able to see the bird because they move so often. It is really hard to trace them. It's, it's definitely um, for um, earlier new birders can be a really frustrating bird to try to get a view on. Um, these are not my pictures because I have mostly pictures of birds that look like they've disappeared in front of you and they just like twisted and flew away. Um, just really a frustrating bird to, to get an eye on, but when you can, they're really cute. And again, they're tiny. These are really, really um, a small birds, smaller than a sparrow, um, maybe chickadee size, maybe a little bit smaller. Um, the golden crown kinglet and the closely related gold crest of Eurasia are the smallest birds able to routinely endure freezing temperatures while maintaining a normal body temperature. OK, this bird weighs about three pennies. That's it's very, very tiny bird. It's very, um, uh, you know, lightweight bird. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I, I think this is fascinating that how small they are and they maintain a body temperature, you know, 103 degrees so 39 41 degrees celsius in, in near freezing temperatures so they're maintaining a body temperature that's 30 some to 40 degrees higher than the the ambient ambient temperature around them okay how do they do that well um they didn't go to to you know a, a coat store but they got a pretty good coat on there uh this is an image that uh was drawn by i believe it was drawn by the author author Bernd heinrich from his book uh winter world and all that fuzz around it, that that light fuzz, that's the tail and the body feathers. The actual body of the kinglet is is very small. So within all that fluff um, is a is a really tiny bird. So there's a lot of insulation there that helps protect that bird's small body from from the cold around it. Um, if you've ever had the opportunity to hold uh, a bird, or if you ever had the opportunity to you know put on the glove and, and, and get an owl, it's always surprising. Um, how light they weigh because some birds do have um you know bones that are pneumatic that have uh gaps and cavities in them to help them uh, lighten their weight so that when they fly they're they're not lifting as much weight uh small birds like this probably don't have many because they don't need to because they're already so small um but those feathers always shape the body and give it you know contours in, in a certain shape that it's not necessarily what's underneath there uh, and also makes them uh, look a little bigger, or a little thicker than they really are. And and kinglets are no exception. Again, these are these are small birds to begin with. Um, so what I want to do is we're going to take a a kinglet hanging out there in the cold, and we're going to take a, a human hanging out there in cold, and we're going to compare them. So we got a human, 155 pounds. It's that's not me. I wish it was. It's not. Uh, you got 166 pounds fully close. You got 11 pounds of insulation. Um, six that's probably boots. Boots or footwear, pretty uh, pretty serious uh, insulation. So out of that, really, it's about five pounds of insulations for the body, everything on the body that's not the feet. Uh, obviously, an in illustration of where we could use a nice counter current system in our legs. Um, and we look at the kinglet, 5.43 grams naked, 0 0.403 grams of body feathers, uh, and 0.95 grams of tail and wing feathers. So their body weight for insulation is about 7.4%. And none of that is for their feet. Uh, as you saw here, I'm not going to go back because I have to go through all those motions again, but they have the, the typical bird feet, the scaly leg and feet. There's no 
uh, feather coverings on them. Like uh, some birds have that, like um, snowy owls, a, a really good example that have, I think, the feathers all the way down to their their talons. But uh, kinglets don't have that, you know, so they don't have that insulation. So all that insulation is just for their body. If we come back to the human uh, and we get rid of the boots, the kinglet has twice the insulation by its percentage of weight as the human. That's how they're able to maintain these temperatures in the winter when they're so small uh, and there's so much heat loss because of that large surface area to volume they're able to maintain that temperature because they're active and they are um so much more insulated they're twice as insulated as, as whatever you would put on to go out in the weather now what are they eating and this is the really interesting question uh and it's surprising uh but it seems like a, a, a large portion of their a portion of their diet is they're still managing to find invertebrates um on the end of all these twigs that they're searching around they're not really seed eaters you know they're picking and, and, and uh pecking and looking for insects and so there are insects that you will still find in the crooks and crannies of uh, tree bark that you'll still find at the ends of um, tree branches that are just hanging out there uh, if you look really closely at this caterpillar it certainly looks like um you know part of the tree this is definitely a caterpillar this well camouflage would be easy to um, hide on, um, you know, a nice wooden background there on whatever log or um, a twig or branch it's on. Um, and this is what they're finding. Um, the author there that I mentioned earlier, Bern Heinrich, did a, a little experiment where he was trying to figure out, um, he was trying to understand what the, the kinglets were eating. And, and again, he's writing this book from Maine, so it's much colder there. And he, he caught a kinglet and he killed it and sampled its its stomach to see what was in there and he found all these caterpillars and he's trying to figure out where it's finding these caterpillars so he went out with a baseball bat and put a blanket under a tree and just whacked on this tree a couple times to see what fell off the branches and he found i think uh, you know several of these geometer caterpillars they'll eventually be a uh, small moth like this um and realized that these these kinglets are doing what most other birds have already left because they couldn't do, and that's have an invertebrate diet in the winter, uh, the toughest times of years to do that, and they're surviving and, and maintaining their heat. And some of it's that insulation, and some of it is um, that that activity that they have where they're just constantly, constantly moving on the search for uh, new bugs to eat. So, what are our potential losses? Okay, I think when a lot of people think of um, you know, water, you certainly don't want to fall in it. You don't want to step in it. You don't want to get cold. Um, and it seems like water would be like the worst place possible to, um, live in the winter, uh, as far as, um, surviving because of the cold, because water obviously can sap the cold right out of you. Um, one of the nice things about being an organism that lives in, in the water in the winter is that water is more thermally insulated than air. You know, today we had, Oh, you know, one of these nights we might have, we might dip into the 20s and then in the middle of the afternoon, if it's sunny all day, we might hit the 50s or even the early 60s. So it's a 40 degree temperature swing. That's all Fahrenheit, but it's a 40 degree temperature swing um, in one day. That water, just like um, as I was talking about the, the organisms themselves, that water has a thermal inertia. You know, it takes a lot of energy to to um, boil a pot of water, for example. I think we, we, a lot of people have experienced that from cooking. It takes time to, to heat that up. Well, that also means that that water doesn't change as quickly in one direction or the other. And so for the organism that might be under that water for throughout the winter, um, it's a very, um, I think, thermally <sighs> safe place to be. It doesn't, doesn't shift as quickly or as, um, as often and so if you're living under there it, it, it can be really really helpful to avoid those big temperature shifts um and again another of my favorite stories that i always talk about is you know one of the old myths that they thought about birds migrating is that birds like swallows would hide out in the bottom of ponds in the mud um and there was always somebody who knew somebody who knew a brother who had a cousin who had a nephew who had a sister who had a brother who was a fisher person who brought up these in a net and they'll tell you that you can find these stories all the time but it's never the person that saw it uh when you when you read these old um accounts of this um and there is actually a lot going on in the water even though it's cold certainly for um you know fish uh as the water gets colder um they they become less active fish have a lot of protectants uh, car protectants as well to keep them from freezing but if you're in a small pond and that water freezes all the way to the bottom, that's 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 a big 
uh, that's a big problem for any organism that's in there, not just fish, but any organism that depends on water for their oxygen. Um, when I worked in Cleveland, I always like to tell the kids to go to the wolf encounter at the zoo. And, if, you know, because they weren't sure what would happen to the fish. I'm like, just go in there and check out the fish. They're just sitting there. They're not moving because it's cold and, and they're not as their metabolism drops, so they're not as active. They don't need as so much food, um, which is great. Uh, and so it all happens. Um, sorry, so it all happens. It They don't need a lot of food because their metabolism has dropped because the temperature has dropped. And so there's a lot of inactivity, just like, what, you know, what we talk about with uh, reptiles and amphibians. It's not really sleeping when they go into brumation. It's just a period of inactivity because the temperature drops, but they still have to get somewhere to shelter themselves from freezing solid from that. So, you know, box turtles go underground and uh, or dig little areas to get out of the um, get down in the ground as much as they can so they don't freeze. Um, you know, fish just have to make sure they don't get frozen in the in the water and hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, but they're, you know, under the water, um, they're just kind of everything slows down and so they don't have as much need for oxygen. The good news, another momentary digression in chemistry, is as the temperature decreases, so on this graph we're actually moving to the left, as the temperature decreases the oxygen solubility increases. So cold water can hold more oxygen. Um, if you like to fish, this is why some fish prefer and need colder streams like mountain streams where the water's colder because they need a higher oxygen count, things like that. The issue though is, the, here, first of all, the good news is if you're underwater, there's a lot more oxygen in the water. And if you're ectothermic and you're cold and your temperature is dropped, your metabolism is dropped, you need less of that oxygen that there's even more of. So it's all good news, except if your supply gets closed off. If the market closes, meaning the top of that lake or the top of that pond freezes, there's very little influx of new oxygen at this point. It can't it can't um, get absorbed. It can't go uh, diffuse into the water um, because that's been covered by ice. And if these plants are not active right now, then they're not. Um, photosynthesizing, they're not producing new oxygen. And if those plants are active, but there's snow on the ice so that they can't photosynthesize, those plants might still be respiring, so they're also using oxygen. So the big, um, the good news is if you're cold blooded, if you're ectothermic uh, and you're under the water, there's more oxygen in the water and your metabolism drops, so that you're using less of the oxygen that there's more of, um, but if it freezes over, then you, you have some other issues to deal with as well. Um, Turtles, frogs, uh, these aquatic animals tend to go down into the pond. Uh, they they nestle down into the mud. Um, and as the temperature drops, their metabolism drops, their need for oxygen drops. Uh, and many of these animals which have to come up for oxygen can spend a great deal of time, several months underwater without any ill effects. Um, turtles have this fascinating little ability called cloacal respiration, okay? When the turtles are under the water, they can leave their mouth open uh, and the water can also ask, uh, access their cloaca, which is their urogenital opening. Um, and water can pass across the walls of their mouth uh, and pass across the, the membranes in their mouth and in their cloaca, uh, and they can respire that way. And even to a lesser extent, some of the skin on their legs will allow for oxygen transfer as well. Excuse me. So what happens is they're underwater and some turtles like the uh, on the right is a map turtle, which is not one we you normally find around here. This is a picture from uh, Lake Erie. You will find them in some um, northern river systems as well. Um, there's a great account in uh, the book I've been mentioned earlier by Bern Heinrich about divers going into this river in upstate New York and finding all these map turtles in the middle of winter just there and they're all they got their legs splayed and they're just hanging out under the water. Uh, they're there for several months uh, until they come up and they don't get a breath of air, yet they're able to get the amount of oxygen they need from the water because their body temperature has dropped and their metabolism has dropped and they don't have the same oxygen needs they had in the summer that they do in the winter. Um, in, the, in, the, in the north, you might get um, a very short summer season where turtles are up and laying their eggs in May or June. Their youngsters aren't full are hatching till 
um, August, maybe even September, and they're, those young turtles are going right into uh, the water for the winter uh, without having them had a meal, and they're able to survive that first winter without having eaten much before they get into the water and have to be there for an entire season for several months, could be six months. Um, and so cloacal respiration is really, really important. Um, if you have any Disney fans in your life, there's a moment in Frozen 2 where um, Olaf the snowman tells one of the other characters that turtles can breathe through their butt. This is the fancier way of saying that. This is what he's talking about. Um, this is also uh, a means of uh, oxygen supplementation that uh, sea turtles will use when they dive deeply when they're in the ocean. Uh, so that's really, really important as well uh, for those guys. Um, if you're in the presence of oxygen, metabolism can be reduced by 95%. If you've actually, you're actually in the uh, absence of oxygen for these turtles, your metabolism can be reduced by 99%. Um, they will actually break down glycogen if it's anoxic, meaning there's no oxygen. Um, and this releases actic, lactic acid, and there is a buffering system in their blood where they can use potassium, their body uses potassium and calcium to buffer that lactic acid, which may, may be borrowed from their shells and skeleton. I think that's still a question. And the same with where they're able to store that lactic acid, if that's actually stored in their cells or their skeleton, and then that's something that their body can uh, remove once the, um, the ice breaks and the temperature um, goes the way they want it to. What if you're a terrestrial turtle? What if you don't go under the water, uh, the bottom of the lake, the bottom of the pond for the entire winter? Well, you could still dig yourself a little spot in the ground, and that's where you can hide yourself out until the following, uh, the following spring. But that doesn't change the fact that you might be submerged. Uh, box turtles can actually tolerate a certain amount of freezing, um, and they can actually remain frozen for at least 73 hours. They can also tolerate um, being covered under spring uh, floods. You know, if you're in areas, uh, if these trails in areas that might be low where there's a lot of flooding in the spring, they can be submerged for several hours and not have a um, negative impact uh, on their body because they're able to, um, again, they're cold blooded. It might not be that warm. They might not still have quite the oxygen uh, about they need. They might be able to absorb a little bit of oxygen uh, out of that water, but they can actually be submerged for several hours in spring um, without any adverse effects. I don't think they can do that in the summer when their metabolism is up, but in the spring, they're they're able to survive those spring floods because of that. Um, so remember when I asked about any coupons or discounts, there's a big advantage to being ectothermic, <clears throat> and there's also a big advantage to having a small brain, okay? Uh, humans have a brain to body mass ratio of one to 40, and it means about two, and a half percent of our um, uh, body mass is our brain, yet 20% of that, 20% uh, of our energy use is used by our brain, okay? In kinglets, that brain to body mass ratio drops to one to 15, um, yet, it, uh, which, or I'm sorry, increases. So that's actually a lot of uh, your brain. And so that can really increase the brain's percentage of energy use. If you look at a turtle, a uh, reptile like a turtle, um, they have a brain that's about a tenth the size of mammals of the same size. OK, so that's a big advantage uh, as well for energy use because they're using a lot less energy to power the brain because it's not a big brain. I'm not trying to be insulting to turtles. I love turtles. But, um, you know, that's that's a, um, a really big advantage to surviving the winter. Uh, and the image here, I just want to point out, this is just a, um, a comparison of the number of visual circuits in a monkey versus a turtle. Um, and that'll give you an idea of why there can there's such a difference between a larger brain and a smaller brain and the amount of energy used. Because there's a lot going on, on in there. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, these are, we got a predaceous diving beetle on the left. On the right, we have some uh, back swimmers. And both of these uh, critters are able to be active in the winter. Uh, if they're if they're heated up a little bit because they both collect oxygen against their body. Um, you can kind of see the silvery sheen. If you look at the bottom right picture, kind of see the silvery sheen on the bottom of the back swimmer there away from the surface it's it's stuck to. Uh, and that is oxygen that they trap against their body. When they're in the water and it's iced over, as they use that oxygen, that oxygen is directly trained. Um, 
connected to their tracheal air system. That's the air system they use to get um, that's the system they use to get oxygen in. These are all oxygen uh, air breathers. They, none of them are uh, able to breathe underwater, so they have to trap body uh, oxygen against their body before they dive. Um, obviously, they use more oxygen when the water is warmer in the in the warmer months. In the cooler months, they can use that oxygen. They use the oxygen uh, at a slower rate. Uh, the other thing that's really nice is because of the oxygen um, content in the cold water, as they use up the oxygen that's attached to their body, more oxygen will diffuse into the into uh, that oxygen reserve from the water. Uh, and so they're able to really supplement that and they're not really, I think, terribly restricted by it as long as there's oxygen in the water. Again, when ice is over the surface, it's a whole, you know, it's a whole different animal at some point. Um, but these are uh, critters that you might see, um, you know, in a pond or underwater. Um, if you're in the Northern Virginia area and you've ever been to Huntley Meadows, you'll see stuff moving around on that wall, ice if it, it freezes nice and clear. If you've got a nice clear night when it freezes and it freezes like a almost like glass, you can see, you'll even see turtles moving under there. Um, we don't have, typically don't have turtles in our pond, but we do have a lot of these critters at, at Gulf Branch. And I've definitely on a clear day seen uh, both these critters and tadpoles moving around under there as well. Um, and never really seen a frog. Frogs are bigger. It's going to take more for them to to um, heat up, but small tadpoles can heat up pretty quickly just with a little, you know, sun sunlight radiation going even right through the ice. And so you'll see them uh, moving around and come up and uh, going up and down and, and you know, uh, being active sometimes in the winter as well. Um, maybe you want to combine your tasks. Maybe you want to work together as a group. Uh, this is a red-sided garden snake, garter snake, and you can see, um, I believe that it's, uh, I don't remember which one it is. It's either the yellow or the red, and I think it's the yellow. It's one of the northernmost uh, snakes you'll find on the continent, one of the northernmost garter snakes. Um, this was a story that fascinated me as a kid because I remember reading this uh, National Geographic issue over and over, but they have these big hibernacula um, in that book, that was Manitoba. This is a um, uh, Narcissus snake dens, um, which might be in Alberta. I'm not sure where, but they have these massive um, hibernacula where you've got tons of garter snakes that stay there in the winter. And then as soon as it's warm enough, they all emerge just in, by the thousands. Um, I know from reading that article, the one in Manitoba is a uh, kind of a sunken limestone pit, a limestone sinkhole, and that's the where the formation is. And these snakes just use it. There's a lot of snakes that do this for winter. Car copperheads use hibernacula and tend to hibernate with each other. Um, and I think in some areas you'll find that the snakes aren't very picky about who else is in there. They're just all there, all in it uh, together, uh, so to speak. Um, uh, and you can reduce the workforce. This is a bald-faced hornet. Uh, and this is a, a nest typical of the the species. I think some of the other members of the genus, uh, the genus is Dilica vespula, and I think they um, other members of the genus use that similar as well. They chew the wood uh, and um, get it into a liquid and then form these these big large paper nests. Um, what happens? <coughs> excuse me. At the end of the season is after all the. Um, the queens and other males have been produced, which is what they, they make workers first to increase their workforce. Uh, and then once they have enough workers, they begin um, um, essentially growing uh, males and, and queens. So they switch from producing uh, workers to producing new queens and males. Uh, and at the end of that growing season, uh, most of the workforce dies off, except maybe the queen. The queen doesn't last very long. She may may die eventually as well. And what happens is all the um, uh, the hornets that were living in this colony no are no longer there. By the winter, they're they're all gone. Um, the new queens and drones, once they have emerged, uh, they fly off to mate, and then the queens will overwinter, um, pre-fertilize, and ready to produce their young uh, the following spring and start their own colony, and it will start all over again but um that's one way to um get through the winter is you did everything you needed to do in the summer to provide for the next generation and then your job is done um this is a overwintering uh queen i found in uh, a couple years ago under a log uh, and i was really hoping she would revive because apparently they have a really they have a really um painful sting uh, but she didn't move too much, so I replaced that log gently and hoped that she had a very productive summer. Um, or you can retask the workforce. Honeybees are, as, as I understand it, the um, 
I think they might be the only insects in the northern hemisphere that are that actively maintain their body temperature and activity throughout the winter. Um, these are swarming, so this is not what they do in the winter. Obviously, there's also green leaves, um, but they will huddle together like this in their hive in the winter with the queen at the center, and they will rotate and maintain um, through exercising their their muscles um, and exercising. They can maintain a body temperature that, or they can maintain a temperature for their colony that can be 20, 30, 40 degrees higher than the ambient temperature around them. Um, I, I think that while that's fascinating, what's most fascinating to me is they do this the entire winter. Uh, bees are very fastidious and very clean. They do not defecate throughout the winter to keep their their colony clean. Uh, and I think that there's probably a lot of bees where they are very, very excited to get out of that. Uh, get out of that hive as soon as they can in the early spring. Um, if one of them decided they couldn't hold it and chose to leave, um, it would probably freeze pretty quickly. The only way they, they are able to survive is staying in this cluster where they're able to keep maintain a, body, uh, a temperature for the colony that uh, allows them to survive throughout the winter, uh, which is pretty fantastic. Uh, and I think that's uh, kind of where I'm at uh, for this evening. So I appreciate you all being with me. I got five minutes left, although I'll take, I can, it doesn't have to be just five minutes for uh, questions, but I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing um, my screen there and see if anybody has any questions. And the chat is uh, lots of spruce wood worms. Yes, they do like that. Um, let's just see if there's any questions in the chat. And there's not. If anybody wants to uh, unmute and ask a question, feel free. Um, I see someone's typing in the chat. I'll see what they have to say. And otherwise, if uh, if everybody's good, um, we can call it a night. I appreciate y'all being here. Oh, thanks, Caroline. Appreciate it. Oh, excuse me. So owls, that's a that's a great question, Jackie. Owls breathe in, breed in the winter, and the idea is, you know, they start establishing territories even now, and they're, and they're finding mates, uh, and they breed in the winter. Um, they're able to do, thank you, Connie. They're able to do um, to do that by, um, they're able to find, you know, food enough for them to eke out their, you know, survival through the winter, and they time the the birth of their youngsters uh, when they're able to get a little bit more food. And so what happens is, um, it's the same with uh, deer. Deer have uh, their rut is going on right now, uh, and they're mating, but they're not going to have their youngsters until the following spring when. Um, you know, there's more food for them. I, and I do think it's fascinating because it's still a, you are having your youngsters uh, at a time, like for deer, you're having young at a time in the spring when it's really, really um, good, when there's a lot of food, there's a lot of flowers, there's a lot of grass. But what happens is that parent is um, carrying the, the, the young around and the developing youngster around during one of the toughest times of the year. And that, that is an, an interesting choice. Uh, and maybe there's an implantation delay. I'm just not aware of in deer, uh, that, that, that development starts a little later in the winter. Um, but yeah, owls, you know, they do their, they set up their territory, uh, and they mate and they lay eggs and they keep them warm throughout the winter. Uh, and then when their youngsters are hatching, they're, um, already at a point where, you know, there's more food and more activity uh, for their prey, so they're able to get food. No, oh, thank you, Jackie. I appreciate it. Well, thank you, everybody. I mean, you guys can ask me questions. Um, no personal questions. No, I'm just kidding. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to ask me. Otherwise, um, if I don't get any more questions, I'll probably uh, wrap it up here in the next minute or so. Um, until then, I'll just stare at you mildly uncomfortably. If nobody has questions. Um, but thank you all for joining me this evening. I appreciate your time uh, and I appreciate you being flexible. I had to, I switched up for the Master Naturalist meeting, so I wasn't competing with that tomorrow. So I'm glad you all could join me this evening. Thank you, Cheryl. Appreciate it. Okay, it looks like we're going. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening.